uh, we, we could try to separate in the definition determinism and predictability. Yes, so the, this was making precise this distinction between determinism and predictability. The point was to go beyond this now well understood distinction uh, and, and, and by the final element realizing that chaotic systems are so sensitive that uh, uh, you would need to know, as Laplace imagined, the position of every particle in the universe. But my point is that the gravity of those particles would include the gravity in the computers doing the calculations. So even logically, uh, you couldn't implement, is in physics, the determinism that you know exists in mathematics, even for chaotic systems. So that was the point the relationship between uh, chaos and quantum mechanics because you drew a very strong line you said you know isolated quantum systems are not chaotic um, and I want to do it by drawing on work that you yourself have done which is to make the point that if you take an ensemble of chaotic systems and study their not their individual trajectories in state space but the probability distribution that they satisfy then you end up with actually a system described by a linear equation which is the Louisville equation mm. and as you well know it's very formally similar to the Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics in many respects so just as we know and understand how chaotic dynamics might underpin or does underpin in the classical sense what looked like very sort of linear type probability distributions. Do you think it's possible that something like this may also ultimately underpin quantum mechanics? In other words, there is some deterministic underpinning, the sort of thing that Einstein, of course, always believed was the case. Um, one point which is often made, which you made, uh, which is that one of the reasons why um, uh, quantum, there's no chaos in quantum mechanics is that quantum Schrodinger equation is linear and that's wrong because there's a counterexample of the Louisville equation so if you take you don't, don't need an ensemble a single particle is a delta function it evolves uh, precisely classically it can have any amount of chaos that you like so that's a mistake and that's why I didn't mention it okay um, now you said that I drew a separation between the classical and quantum to do with the, it when you have chaos. But then I deliberately blurred it by pointing out that as soon as you allow external influences, which may be so weak that you would never think to include them in the dynamics, they do affect the quantum kinematics in the, in the sense that they uh, destroy the coherence that's characteristic of quantum and restore classicality. So that was the point. There's a formula in quantum physics for the uh, expressing the density of states of a quantum system in terms of classical periodic orbits. Now that is isomorphic, you just look at its structure, look at the formula without thinking of the meaning of its terms with something called the von Mangold formula for the, for the um, density function of the, of the Riemann zeros. So there's an analogy, it has the same structure, it's a sum over certain oscillations with exponentially decaying amplitudes and then you can identify term by term different bits of the quantum and the classical. Not enough, as I said, to tell you what the classical system is. We don't even know what the dimensionality of it is. I mean, if I can be provocative, it's probably a little bit more than one, whatever that means. Um, so, so, uh, so that's the basis. It's identifying two formulae which come from completely different intellectual areas, but which have the, a similar structure. You know, the role of Planck's constant is fundamental in um, quantum mechanics. Um, but if it hadn't have been discovered um, experimentally, um, electron spin, hence Planck's constant, would have dropped out of Dirac's mathematics. So, so if Stern and Gerlach had not done their experiment, electron spin could be known as something like a Lorentz charge in uh, uh, units of um, H bar. Um, now we're in the sort of quantum revolution 2.0, and we have these new phenomena like um, entanglement and um, you know demonstrable 
um, uh, demonstrations of that. Do you think there's going to be any further links between um, uh, you know, new, the new phenomena of entanglement and, and the, the mathematical universe, the interplay of physics and mathematics? So you, you, there's two parts to that, because you started talking about Planck's constant, and then you segued into, into entanglement. Yes. And uh, I don't see the connection, but I can... No, make no, no but there, there isn't, I'm, I'm saying... But I can, make, I can make a comment about the first, which is, yes, of course, uh, 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 counterfactually, anything could have been discovered in a number of ways, because physics is multiply connected. And in particular, although... As, as a historical fact, the quantization of spin came out of uh, uh, the Dirac equation. Several authors have pointed out that it's actually equally there if you, if you would consider the Schrodinger equation for several component particles. It's, it's the same thing with the same G factor, too, that you get, whatever. Feynman uh, noted that and, and, and others. I'm not quite sure what your question about entanglement is. I mean, it, although it's a central f ingredient in what you call 2.0, which I would rather state as the, the quantum physics where you directly manipulate individual quantum systems rather than ensembles of them, as in matter. But still, um, we, we, massive entanglement was already there for identical particles. Fermions and bosons are m beautifully, wonderfully, inevitably entangled. When I tell this to my quantum um, uh, information colleagues, they make the point, yes, but it's not a resource that you can use because it's there and you can't avoid it. So, but it's, it's always been there. But if your question was, is there anything new, fundamental that would come out of that, how do we know? I mean, quantum, quantum mechanics does include it, but we know astonishingly little about the detailed quantum structure of the Hilbert space of more than two particles. It's really remarkable. We're just still at the beginning. There's even a question of what's the, how do you define a measure of entanglement? There are a number of them. Perhaps you need different ones for different purposes if you have more than two particles. But none of this is fundamental in the sense of going beyond quantum mechanics. It's beautiful quantum mechanics being explored, but I see no evidence that uh, there will be new beyond quantum physics, if that was what your, your question was. In fact, I was thinking more. Are the recent sort of phenomena from, uh, let's call it quantum mechanics 2.0, yes. um, is, is that going to lead the way to new mathematics? Oh, bound to. Don't know what it is, though. I mean, it's always the case. I mean, who would have thought that uh, number theory would play such a central role in uh, classical chaos as it does? And of course, in retrospect, it's obvious because to a mathematician, rational and irrational numbers correspond to what in physics are resonant and non-resonant, and that's obvious. But we didn't realize how much it would lead to, and now lots of mathematics uh, 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 we never anticipated being applied is. So, you know, difference between rational and irrational, you know, explain the gaps in the asteroid belt and so on. Um, so, yeah, but you can't know in advance. And I don't know. The answer is almost certainly there'll be new math. We know from string theory, regardless of it, whether it corresponds to the physical world or not, and, and, uh, and this is at the moment a matter of religion, um, it certainly led to a lot of beautiful mathematics. So, yeah. You mentioned quite rightly that the, the, the Newtonian um, uh, classical world is not deterministic because there's no such thing as a truly isolated system unless we're talking about the entire universe. In, in quantum mechanics that's even more important because you can't say anything about a quantum system unless you make some separation from its environment and trace over the environment and so on. Um, but you made, a, uh, you, you made a statement right at the very end where you said that these systems are not time reversal invariant, um, suggesting these are not you know, you, you don't get, is the, the question is, do you get chaotic behavior in, in, in an isolated system? Is it possible? Uh, if it's isolated, it's unitary dynamics and it's time reversal invariant. So uh, is it, it uh, is time reversal invariance and irreversibility part of chaos because they, you don't see it unless it's an open system? 
Just to clarify, um, time, lack of time reversal invariance here doesn't mean irreversibility like in... It means lack of time reversibility as when you have a magnetic field. You go around a circle and, uh, and, and if you reverse a magnetic field, you don't retrace your steps. You go around a circle with the other chirality. So it's that. So we're still speaking about unitary evolution and the difference is that when you look at the high excited states, they obey a different universality class of statistics and that was well established in, 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 the, in the 1980s by taking these little model billiards and putting a magnetic field in. So it's different from irreversibility. It's a different thing. But of course your point about uh, non-isolation is exactly uh, the, the point I emphasise, which is that uh, you can't look at anything without doing something to it. And, uh, uh, and very often that involves something that you're not going to analyse precisely. Like nobody ever looks at all the detailed quantum mechanics of the bits of metal inside a, 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 inside a neutron interferometer or, 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 any, uh, or a Geiger counter or any piece of quantum machinery. Yeah. Near the end of the, the talk, you mentioned that the distribution of the Riemann zeros are somehow related to a unknown quantum system. Uh, however, uh, given what you have discussed, we already know quite a lot about what this unknown quantum system looks like. So um, I, I don't understand quantum mechanics very much, but I, I, from what I understand, you can go from the Schrodinger equation to energy levels, and then if you know the energy levels, you can go back and construct a Hamiltonian with those energy levels. So can you do something similar and construct a s approximation to this unknown quantum system, and would that be something interesting to look at? Well, there's something called the Gelfand-Levitan procedure. That's a very restricted world. It says if you have a series of energy levels and that corresponds to the Schrodinger equation in one dimension with a potential, you can find that potential. When you try to do that with the Riemann zeros, you find that the more you include, the more wiggly and wobbly that potential becomes. In other words, it doesn't converge onto, uh, on, 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 onto an answer. You can find uh, uh, potentials uh, uh, it's kind of a trivial thing, uh, which give you the average density of the Riemann zeros, but that ignores all the beautiful random matrix structure which is responsible for the fluctuations of the prime, so that doesn't help at all. Um, so this, those inverse methods don't work, and the reason is that uh, if this conjecture is right, it's certainly not just the Schrodinger equation with some potential. It's something more complicated, particles, uh, multi-component particles, Dirac equation, as I mentioned, or it could be that the unknown Hamiltonian, that's what determines a quantum system, is the sequence of a series of renormalization transfer, and many possibilities beyond this simple Schrodinger, non-relativistic, which, which, sure, which is certainly not what the quantum system is that we're looking for. So those inverse methods don't, don't help. That's, that's, the, that's the bottom line. Speaking about um, um, cosmology and the uh, chaos, anything about uh, chaotic inflation? Is there anything you can tell us? Thanks. Nothing I can say because I don't see any quantum. Oh, well, in the beginning, it was this quantum field theory. But uh, the answer is no, I haven't thought about it in the context that I've been describing. So I, I, I can't comment. I don't know about, uh, the, 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 about what the classical limit would be of quantum inflation, but that leads me to identify a point, because uh, with, um, with chaotic inflation, this is a quantum field, right? Now, a quantum field has infinitely many degrees of freedom. So that means that in addition to small Planck's constant, you've got the other limit of many degrees of freedom. That's why there's a new subject being studied called many-body quantum chaos. So that's where, as well as Planck's constant being small and you get near classical, the number of particles also becomes large. That's a doubly singular limit. If you look in the plane of Planck's constant and one over the number of particles, the origin is gigantically singular. It depends on which direction you approach it. So that's being explored. I don't know if it's explored in the context of inflation, but you would need to. It's an additional level of singularity of limit. 
That's why these problems are so difficult mathematically. Yeah. 